Hi, everyone. Welcome to Being Patient Brain Talks. I'm Deborah Kahn, founder of Being Patient. Can psychedelics be used to treat Alzheimer's? That's a question that science is just asking. Um, we're at the beginning of the research, um, but it's an interesting topic. And we thought we would see where research is and how far there is to go to determine whether or not um, doctors can at one point in the future use psychedelics to treat Alzheimer's. Well, joining me now is Dr. He is from Johns Hopkins University and joins us now um, from Baltimore. Thanks very much for joining us, Al. Hey, how are you doing? Great. So now I know uh, there's still a long way to go with this topic, but it's received a lot of um, it's it's been in the spotlight a lot lately, not just for Alzheimer's, but really uh, it, it looks like science is turning to psychedelics to understand whether or not there is benefit for the brain. So um, to the brain. So I just really want to start with the basics. What is it about psychedelics that makes them interesting um, for scientists to study today? Uh, probably the the you know first place to start there is that. Um, most of these drugs were placed in uh, what we call Schedule One, which is the most restricted class of drugs uh, in uh, early 1970s during the Nixon administration, uh, in the beginning of the so-called War on Drugs. Uh, and you know, uh, in terms of the reasoning behind that, um, there's some uh, cause to suggest that it was more politically motivated than uh, actually related to the. Uh, risk of harms associated with these uh, substances. And, you know, when we're talking about psychedelics, it's important to uh, really zero in on what, what are we talking about? Because um, the word itself was coined by Dr. Humphrey Osmond in uh, the mid 1950s. Uh, and he was specifically talking about a, um, some particular compounds uh, that were popular at that time. And, you know, chief among those was uh, LSD. But we're also talking about uh, drugs like mescaline, which are derived from the uh, peyote and San Pedro cactus, um, dimethyltryptamine, which um, is naturally occurring and found in um, plants that are used to make ayahuasca in South America. Uh, and of course, uh, psilocybin mushrooms, which uh, are found in uh, almost 200 species of psilocybe uh, mushrooms that grow all over the world. And so these are really what we consider the classic psychedelics and, um, you know, they have a long history of use, uh, traditional use among indigenous peoples all over the world, um, usually for uh, more uh, sacramental or spiritual or religious purposes. Uh, however, um, you know, there's been some conjecture for, long, uh, for a long time that there's also medical benefits. And that was something that we started to see uh, dedicated research on in the middle of the 20th century uh, after Dr. Albert Hoffman discovered LSD and, uh, you know, really kind of opened up uh, a new direction for uh, psychiatric research and pharmacological research um, that paved the way for our discovery of serotonin and the neurotransmitter systems as we understand them today. Uh, so, you know, that was an exciting time uh, for the field. Uh, and unfortunately, it was cut short um, in the early 1970s. And so I think one of the things that you're noticing now um, in the popular media and you know, just kind of the more general um, excitement around these substances is that uh, they've really been off limits for several decades. Uh, and that meant uh, that for research scientists, it was near impossible to do work with these drugs legitimately. Um, it, was, it was something that could be done, but it was quite difficult. Yeah. Um, and so, there's been a little bit of a, a sea change in the last 20, 25 years uh, that have contributed to um, some shifts in public perception around these substances uh, and also around their their potential uh, in the medical field and, and how they can be used possibly to help people suffering from different types of medical and mental health conditions. Yeah, and you know, you hear you hear psychedelics being looked at for things like depression. Um, and you know, I have to admit, I, I just read uh, recently Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind, and I found the topic you know, incredibly fascinating um, and found out, you know, I 
I didn't know a lot in terms of how science has a history of really looking into psych um, psychedelics to treat um, as treatment for different types of brain um, disorders. Uh, but I have a question on the very, before we get into the Alzheimer's um, and what you're looking for in your study, on the very basic level, I mean, we know about neuroplasticity. We know that changing patterns in our brain um, are good and, and they strengthen our brain. Do these psychedelics help us in that sense, in terms of really changing patterns inside our brain as a, as a, as a very crude way of asking you, <laughs> non-scientific way? Sure. And, you know, they, you know, these types of drugs, these um, serotonin 2A receptor agonist psychedelics. So these are specifically the ones that I, I was referring to, you know, LSD, psilocybin, uh, mescaline, DMT. Um, you know, we know that they uh, do produce um, some changes in the terms of uh, both brain function and structure. And so when you're talking about neuroplasticity, um, you can talk about both uh you know, structural neuroplasticity, meaning that the actual branches of your, um, you know, brain, uh, the way that it's connected in the cellular level can be changed. Um, and so we're talking about changing the shape of the brain in a way. Uh, and then there's also the uh, functional plasticity, uh, which really is talking more about the way that the different parts of the brain are communicating the way that they talk with one another. And so um, you know, we're finding both of those uh, types of plasticity, both of those types of um, ability to, to create changes, uh, you know, that surround the uh, use of these psychedelics. And so, you know, that seems to hint at some of the biological mechanisms that we're finding in terms of how they can be used clinically. So let's talk about Alzheimer's now. I mean, I know we don't have any conclusive evidence and we're probably a long way away from that, but what in particular um, made you think of Alzheimer's as a, a, a using psychedelics as you know possibly looking down that road to use Alzheimer's to treat um, MCI or, or, or early onset Alzheimer's? Yeah, so um, you know, there's a lot of what we call preclinical literature, basically um, research looking at either animals uh, or cells and just trying to understand uh, some of these underlying uh, effects of these types of drugs and their mechanisms um, in terms of uh, changing learning processes and sometimes impairing or sometimes enhancing learning or cognitive function. And uh, when you start to look at the uh, animal literature in particular, there's a, a very good basis to suggest that when used appropriately, uh, mm -hmm. psychedelics can actually enhance learning, uh, enhance cognitive function. There's lots of different types of learning and memory. Uh, so, um, you know, this is sort of a task dependent uh, effect that's been discovered. But, um, you know, we're seeing uh, things around working memory, uh, object consolidation, fear memory that suggests that um, when you're uh, administering uh, psychedelics to animals in these kind of lab models of learning, um, that if you do it at the right time in these critical windows, uh, you can actually improve the learning and memory process uh, and that you can also help them to unlearn uh, certain maladaptive behaviors. For instance, when they become fearful of a certain space where they've been shocked and then you put them back in that space and they're not getting shocked anymore, you know, they can often be wary of going back in there because they're afraid it's going to happen again. Um, but after a, a few repetitions of going in there and not being shot, you'll see that the animals can unlearn that fear response more quickly, which has ramifications for things like, for instance, post-traumatic stress, where a person can be in a dangerous situation, learn that they need to be very anxious uh, about that, and then have a, a difficult time shutting that process down later. Um, and so there's definitely uh, some uh, very important function of the serotonin 2A receptor, which is one of the principal areas where these psychedelics work in terms of memory and learning. Um, and so we're just starting to, to tease that apart now.
Well, I, I, I can't help but think about Steve Jobs' biography, you know, the founder of Apple, who said that he probably couldn't have created Apple unless he had taken um, LSD and some of these drugs. So, you know, maybe there is truth to it. I don't know. I think we have to study it. But and obviously we're not saying go out there and find some LSD. You know, we, we there's still a lot of research. But how do you even go about? I mean, I'm, I guess I, I have a couple of questions, um, but. First, let's start with how do you even go about testing these on um, on a disease like Alzheimer's and and know knowing if it's a um, determining whether or not it's a viable treatment? That's actually pretty simple. Uh, thankfully, um, because there's such a huge uh, need for novel medications for Alzheimer's and different types of dementia, um, you know, there's a, a lot of work going on in the field, and so. Uh, in the last 30 years or so, we've seen hundreds, literally hundreds and hundreds of medications be tested. Uh, and, you know, some of the, the kind of basics uh, around that type of work include looking at um, stuff like uh, whether or not uh, people are having improvements in memory and working memory uh, using simple tests, um, if they're uh, seeing improved cognition, uh, if the, their loved ones uh, or their caregivers are noticing improvements in their mood or their memory. Um, and so, you know, in these types of clinical trials um, usually you start uh, small and you kind of extrapolate from the preclinical literature, uh, something like uh, an animal test you know, model that shows enhancements in learning and memory and that it's not harmful and it's non-toxic. Um, luckily, uh, because we've been working at our lab and others um, really actively with psilocybin, uh, which is derived from so-called magic mushrooms, um, you know, we've got a good uh, basis of human research to also kind of look back on and say, you know, this really seems to improve quality of life. Um, you know, there's some anecdotal evidence like you were citing, you know, from Steve Jobs and others who say that, um, you know, the experience can change the quality of one's thinking. Uh, it can maybe uh, improve creativity uh, creativity or creative thinking. Um, and so, you know, we kind of uh, stacked on top of both the animal literature and what we've seen in um, patients with depression, cancer patients with psychosocial distress, um, healthy normal volunteers, you know, the, the positive uh, benefits that they've been reporting uh, and the brain changes that we're seeing, which last not just when the person is under the influence of the drug, but one week and even one month later, we're still seeing changes in the brain function after a single high dose. And so that's the type of research that uh, kind of pointed us in this direction to design the small trial that um, we're running at Hopkins right now, which is really um, you know, doing an extensive battery of memory testing before and after uh, a couple of doses of psilocybin, and then kind of continuing to follow up on that for several months afterwards to see how memory is being affected. Um, you know, our real primary endpoint for this study is to look at um, whether or not uh, the psilocybin can be helpful for improving mood uh, and specifically uh, symptoms of depressed mood. Uh, it's very common, obviously, for people when they get these types of diagnoses to, um, you know, suffer from some uh, depressed mood, anxiety. Uh, it's very natural to have that type of response. Um, but there's also uh, some research that suggests that the more depressed mood and the more anxiety that people are experiencing, the worse off they could be in terms of their uh, memory function down the line. And so that could be adversely impacting them. So there's also the question that maybe by just helping them have uh, less depressed mood, less anxiety, that maybe we're helping them prolong their um, you know, ability to think clearly and, and their memory function uh, for a longer period. Okay, so that's a good segue into my next question, which is the ability to think clearly. I mean, psychedelics, don't they make us a little bit, you know, send us into another world and um, uh, take us a little bit further away from reality? I mean, if you use this as a treatment, are you really going to feel like, are you going to be on a drug trip? I mean, is it is it like taking drugs or is there a way like, you know, we've seen marijuana cultivated in many different ways um, to use as treatments um, and the CBD is the part that is, you know, more so than the THC. So people don't necessarily have to get stoned um, to use marijuana as a treatment. 
is it the same with these drugs or would you really um, be on a drug trip if you, if you had to take them? So the jury's still out on that. And, you know, there's a couple of different ways or there's a few different approaches here. Um, one that, uh, you know, has been gaining a lot of notoriety lately is using what they call uh, microdoses. So very small doses that would be so small that um, typically you wouldn't notice any sort of subjective or psychoactive drug effects. And there's an idea that uh, by using um, continued microdosing of LSD or psilocybin or something like that, that you may have enhancement of mood or memory function over time. Uh, and this would be very similar to what you see with your normal kind of SSRI treatments for depression, for instance, where you're seeing an incremental pharmacological intervention that's um, ongoing for a long period, uh, sometimes weeks, months, or longer and hoping that that uh, is causing these uh, gradual changes that uh, persist over time. And so if you're taking that route, that's certainly a possibility that um, using microdoses or very low doses of psychedelics could help people to uh, have enhanced thinking and, and enhanced mood uh, over the long term. Um, but the, you know, the evidence is not clear on that yet. And so far, the few small studies that we've seen looking at those types of questions have been pretty um, inconclusive, I'd say. They're not really showing that at least acutely or in the short term that you're seeing improvements, at least in healthy people. Um, and that, of course, could change if you're looking at a clinical population. What do we know, know about uh, psychedelics and the potential to um, have an impact in the longer term? Um, so it's interesting because when we talk about a treatment, you know, some sometimes, I mean, especially when it's some sort of medication or something, it's more in the short term, right? It's like, how do I um, stop the depression for the time being, you know, but it sounds like the way that you're talking about it and in the preliminary animal studies, you're looking more as actually changing the function of the brain, which has longer term impl impl um, implications. Am, am I right about that? Right. So, you know, moving away from the microdosing work, um, which I think is still, you know, in its early stages, but certainly has a lot of promise, particularly around its anti-inflammatory effects. My friend, Dr. Charles Nichols is working on at LSU, finding some really uh, intriguing results. But um, a lot of the human research that's been ongoing for the last 20 or so years, looking at psilocybin specifically um, for uh, healthy people, as well as for um, people with things like depression, anxiety, or addictions, uh, is finding that uh, using a very high dose uh, and using it maybe once, twice um, in a structured intervention can uh, really give you uh, these long-term changes that um, you know, people are reporting for three, six, nine, 12, or more months afterwards. Um, and so, you know, the reason that that's very exciting is because it's not uh, your typical uh, pharmacotherapy type of situation where in order to deal with the symptoms, you're continuing to take the medication over and over again. Uh, it's more that you're able to really leverage uh, that one or a few doses of, of um, the psychedelic within a, a sort of structured intervention to help people make uh, more lasting changes. And, you know, in answer to your earlier question, um, yes, much of uh, this type of work is really focused around um, what people colloquially, colloquially, <laughs> colloquially call the trip. Uh, what people, you know, talk about is being those um, psychedelic drug effects where they are, um, you know, seeing and feeling and thinking quite differently than they normally do. Um, now, uh, you know, that can be concerning for some people, but, um, you know, we've developed a protocol and, you know, there's been a long standing use of these substances um, in ways that are safe that aren't harmful to people. Uh, and actually my professional opinion is that there's quite a lot of value to these, um, what you might call altered states of consciousness. And just to move away briefly from Alzheimer's for a moment, um, you can think of uh, the area of addiction treatment where you have a person who is actively struggling to uh, make a change in certain behavior or certain relationship with the substance that they have. Uh, and they know that it's harmful for them and they know that they wanna make that change. And uh, yet they're kind of struggling to, to do that. And there's something about the actual experience with these psychedelics 
that can through to uh, help provide uh, some motivation, um, some uh, you know different perspective or insight on their situation that then when they come out of that, they are able to make those changes. And uh, so there is something about um, you know the acute experience um, or the trip uh, as people call it, um, which is directly associated with long-term benefits. Um, but it's still, you know, it's still a little bit uh, mysterious, and it's something that we're continuing to try to understand, uh, both looking at the biological mechanisms in the brain, um, but also, you know, asking people about their experiences and what what they think they mean to them. So, how long will it be? How long will this research take before we'll get answers? I mean, I'm, you know, Grant, like, let's talk in terms of um, a treatment for MCI and Alzheimer's. Like, what are the next steps? How long do you think it will be before you actually understand if this is a viable treatment? Oh, I imagine in the next three years, we will have a, at least a Cliff Notes answer. Um, and, you know, that's really initially just looking. If we give these drugs to uh, this population, you know, what's the impact? Is it changing their mood? Is it changing their memory? Is it changing their quality of life? Uh, if so, is it changing for the better? Uh, or is it staying the same or getting worse? And so we, we should be able to answer those types of questions uh, within the next three years is our hope. Are you um, recruiting people yet or not yet? Yeah, well, uh, we, we are recruiting people for my study at Hopkins and uh, I know uh, there are other groups that are working on some microdosing studies as well, um, and I'm not sure where they are in terms of recruitment. Uh, but uh, yeah, the only the only caveat is right now we're shut down with the uh, uh, current uh, coronavirus, right? But uh, we hope to resume uh, our recruitment, and we are still collecting um, people's contact information at our website, which is um, HopkinsPsychedelic.org, and that's got a link to all of our studies, but. Uh, up to and including our study in people with early stage Alzheimer's. How many people are you recruiting for that study? For this initial pilot study, we're hoping to recruit uh, in the neighborhood of about 20 people all told. And just again, giving everybody the same open label treatment. So no placebo, everybody gets two doses of psilocybin and we follow them out uh, for several months to look at impact on mood and memory. Is, um, are you only, um, is it, uh, who qualifies? Is it MCI early onset? Who, who are you looking for? So typically early onset is uh, considered people who are younger who are getting um, Alzheimer's diagnosis. Uh, so that's not exclusionary for us. But uh, what we're really looking for is either MCI, mild cognitive impairment, uh, or early stage Alzheimer's. So somebody who is not in a very advanced stage uh, where you may be seeing uh, you know, um, more functional impairment, but somebody who's still um, in the very uh, early phases of the disease progression uh, so that we can see at that point what the impact looks like um, and if it helps in terms of the further progression later on down the line. All right. Um, well, thank you, Al. Um, please keep us posted. We're interested in the topic, obviously. I'm sure a lot of people in our audience are. Um, and let us know um, as the, the results come in where, where you're at and, and whether there is um, any impact. But thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. And we'll post a link um, to your Hopkins website um, on, underneath this interview. If people have more questions, I'm assuming they can email you questions. Absolutely. You can contact me directly. I'll be happy to speak with them. Okay, great. We'll post all that information on um, beingpatient.com. Um, we'll, as always, we'll take these interviews, we'll upload them onto our website. Um, if you want to know more about these interviews, please sign up to our newsletter at beingpatient.com. Um, and we hope this is an interesting topic. Um, obviously, there's still a lot more that we need to learn um, about it. And um, we'll let science tell us where this one's going. But thanks very much. Um, again, for joining us and we will um, uh, go to beingpatient.com for more.